For at TV, the world is thinking. Two examples, really, to, to talk about uh, how I see the, the example of Indian pluralism. One goes back to before the 50th anniversary of India's independence, the 49th, in fact, when um, our then Prime Minister, H.D. Devagada, stood at the ramparts of Delhi's 16th century Red Fort and delivered his Independence Day address to the nation in Hindi, India's so-called national language. Well, eight other prime ministers had done the same thing 48 times before him. But what was particularly interesting was that Devagada, who many of you know is a southerner from the state of Karnataka, Ghansham state, stood and made this speech in a language of which he did not know a word. Tradition and politics required a speech in Hindi, so he gave one. But the words had been written out for him in his native Kannada script, in which, of course, they made no sense. Now, to me, this represents some of the best of the, one of the best of the oddities that make India, India. Because probably nowhere else in the world could you find a country uh, whose national language is not understood by its prime minister, or indeed <laughs> by half its population. A country where, where precisely somebody whose mother tongue is so completely removed philologically, lexicologically from the national language is able to stand and address his people. And equally perversely, a country in which this particular solution was found. Because um, I remembered uh, from the 1980s, uh, the great Kerala singer K.J. Yesudas, who came frequently to number one in the Bollywood filmy music charts <coughs> by singing songs in Hindi. And I saw his, his songbook. All the lyrics had been written out for him in Malayalam for him to sing, because he couldn't read Hindi. But to see that solution elevated to the prime ministerial address on Independence Day was, for me, a startling affirmation of Indian pluralism. And I've argued, both in that book and, and in this one, that, of course, the centrality, the central experience of India is that we are all minorities in India. And I think Pramit and I can talk about that a little later. The second example that perhaps I've been guilty of overusing in recent years, but one worth mentioning again, was the extraordinary sight three years ago, at the end of the elections of 2004, in May of 2004, of a Roman Catholic political leader of Italian origin, Sonia Gandhi, making way for a Sikh, Manmohan Singh, to be sworn in as prime minister by a Muslim, President Abdul Kalam, in a country 81% Hindu. I mean, that is again something that is extraordinarily about what India is all about. And it's particularly, I think, resonating in a country, in this country, the world's most powerful and longest lasting democracy, which for 220 years hasn't managed to elect a president or a vice president who's anything other than white, male, and Christian. So perhaps there is something about the Indian experience that even this democracy can learn from. And that, I think, is the sort of Indianness that I uh, have written about in this book.